No. Yes. And are we recording? We are. Okay. All right. Good afternoon. Thanks for your patience. Uh, took us a few minutes to get started there. And thanks for joining our conversation about COVID on college campuses. Um, this discussion was organized by Stout United, which is UW Stout's local chapter of the American Federation of Teachers. Here's the plan for this afternoon. We'll have three brief presentations by Drs. Alex Hall, Jeff Sweat, and Emmy Stemke, who are going to bring their professional expertise to bear on the challenges that we're going to face as we invite students back to campus this coming fall. The majority of our time, however, will be a moderated discussion with our panelists. You can use the panel on the right side of Microsoft Teams to submit questions, which I will then collate and pose to our panelists. We've also had a few questions pre-submitted. Before we get going, three quick points. First, none of our panelists is actually in UW Stout's administration, and only Dr. Sweat, as far as, I'm, as far as I know, is actively involved in any of the committees that are actually doing the work for planning for this fall's reopening at Stout. So instead of asking a question like, what is our plan for X? You might consider asking instead something like, what do you think should be in our plan for X? And second, we'd like to get a little bit of a read on how widespread each question or concern is. So I'll both ask the question to the panelists and also post it to Microsoft Teams. When I do so, you'll see a little thumbs up button. And if this question or concern is um, one that you also share, please go ahead and click on the little thumbs up button so that we can get some feedback about how many of the folks who are joining us share these questions or concerns. And finally, if you'd like to submit your question anonymously, you can do so by clicking the anonymous question button in Teams. All right, on with the show. So first up, we have Dr. Alexandra Hall. She's a physician at UW Stout Student Health Services and a valued colleague and lecturer in the biology department. Dr. Hall. Thank you so much, Brian. So when I have five minutes to talk to you, and so I thought, okay, what are the key concepts that I think are really central to understanding how this virus may impact our operations in the fall and how we go about planning? So I have four concepts, key concepts that I wanna share with you today. The first one is that people with no symptoms can transmit this virus. So people who are either pre-symptomatic or completely asymptomatic. And in fact, modeling estimates show that probably about 50% of cases are due to transmission when the person had no symptoms. So we have really good data too that shows that viral shedding and those who will develop symptoms begins one to three days before their symptoms. And then it can peaks on the first day of symptoms Symptoms and then gradually diminishes over the next several weeks thereafter. So this is really important because we have to assume that everyone, no matter whether or not they have symptoms, is potentially infectious. So even people who feel totally fine can be transmitting this virus and emitting it out into the, into the environment. So that's point number one. We have to assume everyone is potentially infectious. Point number two has to do with how this virus is emitted from our own bodies and what measures have been shown to be helpful. So this virus hijacks the little par little particles of moisture that leave our bodies every time we exhale. The larger ones that are five to 10 microns in size are called respiratory droplets. The smaller ones that are less than five microns are called aerosols. And both types of particles are released in greater numbers and with greater trajectories depending on how forcefully you are exhaling. So if you're sitting quietly, you're not exuding very many, but if you're talking, it goes up. If you're talking loud, Loudly, it goes up further, and even more so if you're exercising, singing, laughing, coughing, sneezing, right? So that's really important. Now, those two different kinds of sizes of particles that I mentioned, so those droplets, because they're relatively large, they don't get very far before gravity pulls them down to the ground. So that's where that six feet rule of physical distancing comes in. They don't travel much further than that, except for under those other conditions I mentioned, like loud speech, shouting, singing, exercise. So that's really important. Those smaller aerosols, however, 
aren't really pulled upon by gravity. They can linger in the air for several hours. We don't know how much those are responsible for actual transmission of this virus. For the most part, it looks like they're not a huge part of transmission, but in some environments, such as when you have a lot of people in a closed and poorly ventilated uh, indoor room, they may be significant. The jury's still a little bit out on that. So the good news is that wearing a mask actually significantly decreases the emission of these droplets and aerosols and therefore virus that's hijacking them into the environment. In fact, we have really good data that shows that wearing a mask is very effective at decreasing how many viral particles are released, as well as then also making a difference in terms of decreasing actual transmission rates. So point number two then is because of how this virus is emitted and transmitted into the environment, wearing masks and maintaining physical distancing together in the indoor environment are highly effective. Point three, we need to be prepared for absenteeism, like probably a lot of absenteeism. So anytime a student gets a runny nose or a sore throat or a cough or a fever or a headache or a weird rash even, we're probably going to be asking them to stay home, not go to class, go to student health services, get tested, and then wait for that test result to come back and be negative before they're allowed to return to class. Right, so that's reason number one. Reason number two is that if a student is a close contact of somebody who's diagnosed with COVID, that student must quarantine for 14 days. No classes, no leaving their dorm room for 14 days. So three is prepare for absenteeism. Four then is what's a close contact, like how many people are we talking that are gonna need to quarantine? So the current definition of a close contact based on what we're seeing in terms of disease transmission from the epidemiologists and the case investigations, is somebody who spends 10 to 15 minutes or longer within six feet of a positive case of, of COVID. So if we're all masked and distancing in our classrooms, if a student tests positive for COVID, we don't need to quarantine and neither do the other students in the room. So that's going to be an important thing for us all to remember as we think about like, oh my gosh, if I have a student who tests positive, does that mean I'm out of work for two weeks or home for two weeks? And the answer to that is no, as long as we're following those guidelines. So my four concepts that I wanted to kind of uh, share with you today are that asymptomatic people who feel well can transmit the virus, masks and distancing seem to be really effective, we need to really plan and expect high absenteeism, and we're not likely to be close contacts as long as we're following the safety measures outlined. So I'll stop there and I'll look forward to your questions. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Hall. Um, next up is Dr. Emmy Stemke. She um, is an instructor in the Professional Communications and Emerging, uh, Emerging Media Program. Uh, Dr. Stemke. And now I'm unmuted. I don't know how smoothly this thing goes back and forth between screen shares, so we're going to give that a try real quick here. Can you see my screen? There's always a little bit of a delay using this particular platform. Anything going on? Not from this end. All right, so that is not crucial. It was just an attempt. All right, so back to my face. All right, so sorry if I seem to be looking down. My camera's way above my laptop, so I'm kind of looking all over the place. But I am talking today about the importance of communication in times of crisis. We've had a lot of um, crosstalk and a lot of different meetings. We don't know who knows what. People are hearing a lot of different messages from a lot of different places. So I work a lot in risk communication. And I wanted to stress a few of the key points about risk communication and effective communication when we're talking to a really diverse group of stakeholders like we are on Stout's campus. First off, I don't have my slides, so I'm just going to like wave my hands with numbers. My first point, any public risk has two main parts, the actual risk and people's perception of the risk. They can both be equally important. And our goal is to create a match between those components 
in order to avoid over or under perceived risks. And our current crisis has both, of course, people who are perceiving a risk for things like perhaps 5G that is overstated and people who are looking at mortality rates and saying, well, that's not many people understated risk. So we're trying to bring the perception and the risk itself in line. And the best way to do that is through creating a very clear and consistent message. So if we end up going back and forth on our message, if we seem to change our vocabulary, our approach, people start losing faith in us and we start having more issues getting buy-in. Part of the difficulty of maintaining that clear, consistent message is that you need to review and update your message frequently, but you need to do so without seeming to contradict what you said previously. In response to local conditions, not just uh, national conditions, we do need to be very careful to always keep that as updated as possible. We need to involve all of the stakeholders that we possibly can through open forums, through listening. We always remind people in risk communication that the only way to find out what your stakeholders really need is to listen to them. Communication absolutely cannot be just one way. We always need to keep that two-way communication in line. And we need to use multiple modes of delivery, being aware that not everyone has the same level of access to these same modes of delivery. So returning to this idea of public risk having these two components, the risk itself and the perception of risk, one of the examples that we cite really often in risk communication that I think is important to think about in the terms of this crisis is the 20th anniversary report on the Chernobyl disaster by the UN. Anyone see that lovely piece? It was terrifying, but there was one quote from it that I like to bring out when we're talking about dealing with public perception of risk because the report stated that the impact on mental health was in fact the largest public health problem created by that accident. And that profound impact was attributed to a lack of accurate information, uncertainty, people getting crossed messages, improper risk communication in general. So we have ample research showing that we will have a profound mental health trauma risk if we give crossed messages. It is incredibly important to keep that consistent, keep that clear, be responsible how we handle it, and make sure that we aren't actually causing distress that exacerbates the whole crisis by that sense of confusion. We call that the dread factor a lot. Crossed messages really amp up that dread factor. We wanna keep that way down. The last thing that I wanted to talk about is this idea of misleading narratives that are going around. Everyone has heard a lot of misleading narratives and conspiracy theories, people trying to downplay this, call it a flu, what have you. And it's important to consider when students bring this up, when our colleagues bring this up, even when our administrators bring up misleading narratives, that the more a narrative is repeated, the more traction it gets, the more people believe it, the more people understand it to be true, even if you debunk it immediately afterwards. It's called the illusory truth effect, where even if you're debunking it, you're repeating it. And the more you repeat it, the more it sinks in. So what we have to do is correct that narrative, that misleading information with a counter narrative without repeating the false claim, because that will just drive it in deeper. And that can be really hard to learn to do actively in classrooms, especially because so many of us are used to teaching by setting up, here's something horrible someone did, or look at this grammar mistake, isn't that ungodly awful? And then we correct it. But if we do that with potentially even trauma causing misinformation about public health, we're driving that in deeper. So if somebody says something like, are you sure we should be worried about this? Because you know, only 1% of people die of it. Instead of repeating, well, yes, it does have a low risk of mortality, only 1% of people die, we respond with, it's important to keep in mind that in a highly transmissible disease, a 1% fatality rate could come up to as many as 3 million Americans. So we don't repeat the idea that it's not bad, we give it a counter narrative instead. I think I am probably at about time, aren't I? Um. My timer says, yeah, about about so, but if you have a, a closing thought or two, that would be great. Recap one more time. Messaging incredibly important. Mental health trauma can be caused by conflicting messages, 
And in some cases like Chernobyl, that could be the biggest public health risk out there. We need to be consistent. We need to involve our stakeholders. We need to ask people what their perceptions are. And when their needs and perceptions reflect an inaccurate narrative, the best way to respond to that is to offer a counter narrative without repeating and re-emphasizing the mistaken information. Really? All right, I'll wrap up there. I'll All right. Bring my camera down next time. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Stemke. Okay, and then our final presenter here to share his expertise with us is Dr. Jeff Sweat. He is a sociologist in the social science department. Dr. Sweat. Hi. Um, yeah, those were wonderful presentations and I'm, I'm very pleased to, to close out this uh, uh, panel. Um, I think it's a lot of excellent information. Uh, the first uh, thing that I really want to talk about is sort of what is concerning many of us, um, whether the students are going to cooperate with the safety measures, what they're going to do when they're not in the classroom, what are they going to do if there are parties, you know, that sort of thing. I think it's in the back of a lot of our minds, you know, there, are there going to be risk behaviors that happen when we're not watching? And um, I think that it's true that it's likely to happen. Um, those things are um, valid concerns. Um, but I also want to talk about how we can promote uh, sort of healthy behaviors and reduce risk taking um, among students. And so I want to talk about um, the health belief model. This is a model that was put forward in the 1950s and it's still used today in public health. Uh, it was developed by Erwin Rosenstock and colleagues uh, at the Public Health Service. And I do have a visual here as I'm talking about this model. Let's see if I can get the share to work. Are you all seeing that? Not quite. One moment. Okay. I can see it. Apparently it likes you better. There we go. <laughs> now, now it should be out. <laughs> okay. Okay, perfect. Um, so this is the health, health belief model in a nutshell. And there are a lot of things that we really don't have any control over whatsoever. We have no um, control over, um, you know, who who our students are demographically, at least as as professors, you know, we really don't have any uh, impact on that. Maybe with recruitment, we could we could diversify our student body a bit, um, but we don't really have that much control over the students that we get. We don't have that much control over their psychological characteristics. So that left hand box there. What we can do the middle section of the belief model. And this is kind of going back to what, um, to what uh, Professor Stemke was saying about perception. Uh, we can uh, impact the perception of our students. So uh, there are really four major characteristics I want to highlight um, about perception. We can, um, we can affect whether students feel that this is a problem okay is this are they susceptible to the problem that perceived susceptibility um, is a real issue with COVID because a lot of young people have been told that they're not going to get as sick or that they are that some of them might think that they can't even get infected um, and so uh, basically we need to counter that and dispel the myth that young adults aren't getting sick that young adults can't spread this. So if there's any misinformation out there, we need to try to counter that. Um, the second thing I want to talk about is perceived severity. Uh, and that has to do uh, with the idea that there's a lot of there are a lot of counter narratives out there as as Emmy was talking about. Uh, folks are hearing the message that really isn't any worse than the common cold or flu. Um, some people might even think it or, or at least that's in a proportion in the media. They're hearing this um, from peers, from parents. Um, many of them will be hearing this message. They might see it in the media that they that they watch. Um, so we need to really understand that these narratives exist and we need to uh, create a counter narrative to those uh, false narratives. 
Um, so we need um, primarily to build trust, and I think this is sort of re-emphasizing something that Emmy was just talking about. We need to build trust with all of our stakeholders and our students in particular, um, so that we're seen as legitimate sources of information beyond what they're hearing from, from other sources. Um, and I think kind of getting back to that issue of consistency and uh, being seen as um, providing truthful information uh, when it might be different than the information they're hearing um, elsewhere. Um, the third thing is perceived benefits. So people are only going to act um, and change their behaviors if they truly think that those, those behaviors are going to decrease their risk. Okay, I'm gonna talk about masks as a prime example of this. There's a lot of information out there um, about masks, and this has been a highly politicized issue. Um, it's politically charged. Your masks have been a sign of whether you're on the left or the right politically, and that is very, very harmful because what we know from what um, Professor Hall was saying, masks are very effective uh, combined with other safety measures. So it's important that we wear them. Um, it's important that we convey to students and um, let them know that this will actually decrease this ri their, their risk if they do this and they're consistent with mask wearing. Um, and we need to really emphasize that they are empowered to protect their own lives and other people's lives through the safety measures uh, that we're proposing for them. And if they feel empowered and they feel a sense of self-efficacy, they're much more likely to uh, to go along with the safety measures and the uh, reduced risk taking um, measures that we're um, telling them to comply with. Um, the fourth thing is perceived barriers. Uh, and I think this is also really, it's sometimes very difficult to follow health, health guidelines. Students are going to um, feel peer pressure, for example. They're going to um, be in settings, especially outside of the classroom, where um, maybe they're going to be influencing each other to not follow uh, the distancing and mask wear safety procedures. Um, so this this idea of the new normal, it's not going to happen automatically. Um, let me not share my screen anymore. So. So we, you know, we talk about this new normal and it's not something that we can just put out there of here is the new normal and everyone's just going to fall in line. We need to establish the conditions and and promote the healthy behaviors um, in a way that it's easier for people to go along and cooperate with, these, um, with these strategies. Uh, so we always need to be aware of how are we going to make this? Um, if we make it easier, it's much more likely that people will follow the rules. Um, so that's that's what I have. Um, and I look forward to the questions. All right. Thank you so much again to doctors uh, Hall, uh, Stemke and Sweat. I um, found those perspectives frankly fascinating um, and I haven't been getting those perspectives anywhere else, which is really, uh, really interesting. So let's start with um, a question for Dr. Hall. That is not the question that I meant to publish. Let's try this again. Here we go. Um, oh, the publish button is above the question. So the qu so there have been a, a number of questions kind of around the preparedness of uh, student health to handle cases and um, and testing and contact tracing and testing and you know and what are the things that potentially that we can do as faculty and staff if there are holes you see in in in, in that to um, to help fill those holes. Okay. Um, so I'll reiterate that I'm not a part of administration or leadership um, at all in this university, including at Student Health Services. Um, so I, but I can tell you a few things. One is that Student Health Services is staffed by the equivalent of one FTE of a physician and MD. I'm 0.2 of that. The medical director, Dr. Rhodes, is the other 0.8 and a full-time nurse practitioner. We had a 
a second nurse practitioner who just retired and due to budget constraints, that position has not been rehired. We also have an RN and we also have a few LPNs. So that's our staffing at Student Health Services. Uh, we are very well informed about this virus and we've been communicating with our colleagues at campuses all over the country. Um, so we know our stuff, which is really good. Um, and we also are very fortunate that the lab that we contract with for laboratory testing that we can't do in house, so that would include the COVID test, is Marshfield Clinic Labs. And right now Marshfield Labs still has only a one to two day turnaround time for the, the COVID test, the PCR test that we use to look for active infection. So that's pretty, pretty good actually. Uh, many of our neighboring campuses who were trying to do the on-site rapid test. Uh, those machines are back ordered and the cartridges to run the tests are back ordered. So that's the rapid test. It's not uh, really available. And they use other labs like Quest Diagnostics you may have seen in the news this week uh, do the increased number of tests. Their turnaround time for outpatient, meaning non-hospitalized people, is about six to eight days right now. So right now we're anticipating that we're going to be able to assess students and test them in a timely fashion and that we should have test results in one to two days, perhaps a bit longer if things change and once everybody goes back to school. Um, so the the second question about in terms of caring for students. So we're pretty good at caring for college students, which is awesome because it's what we've been doing for a long time. and. Um, most of our students will probably not get severely ill, but in our age group, we're looking at about 3% of them needing hospitalization, right? And so we do have a hospital here in town, as you know, uh, that has a four bed ICU and I think maybe about 20 beds for other hospitalized patients. But right now the Menominee Hospital is not hospitalizing COVID patients. They're being transferred to Eau Claire so that you can kind of concentrate people where there's more expertise. Um, so I don't want to talk forever about that. So it's very hard for us to anticipate how many students with symptoms we're going to be seeing. We know how many students with upper respiratory symptoms like runny nose, cough, sore throat we see in a typical semester, but that's when they're not all wearing masks. <laughs> that's when they're all slobbering in each other's drinks. And so we are anticipating that there might be some decreased transmission of those other common infectious uh, diseases that we see in college students. And in fact, uh, state epidemiologists have seen significant decreases in other infectious diseases because of the masks and the physical distancing and the measures people are already doing. Um, so, but it's, it's, it's a big unknown in terms of what types of numbers we're going to see, and it's going to depend on a lot of different factors. So I think that's probably the best answer I can give right now. All right. Thanks, Alex. That was uh, very enlightening. Um, here is one for Dr. Stemke. So um, I guess I can speak from my personal experience that I'm getting like different messages from different channels, from the administration, via my chairs, from my colleagues, and sometimes these messages are conflicting. Um, and so I guess two related questions, is there a better model? Um, and like, where is the breakdown there? Um, and as a consumer of those messages, um, like, what can I be doing? What can we be doing to kind of sort through those and get as much signal from the noise as we can? That is a million dollar question right there, because a lot of the time when you get conflicting messages, we tell people to do their own research. And you may notice that uh, if we ask people to do their own research, they come up with a lot of different answers. So usually it is better to tell people, reinforce the message, to listen to the people who have expertise in that area. And what I would love for, to see us do more of is opening up more channels to talk to people who have that expertise and really foregrounding the participation of people who have that expertise. So we don't just say perhaps this task force, this committee, this office have said it, but this office informed by this person with this kind of expertise or in consultation with people who are um, hold MDs or have uh, backgrounds in um, epidemiology. 
that might give us a stronger message if we really make sure we involve those people and we highlight the fact that we have those experts so that people can build more of that trust that uh, Jeff talked about. As far as the first one you asked about a way to, did you post the question itself? Because you were thinking about a way of, it was announcements, wasn't it? Yes, yeah, so the, the question is kind of, is there a better emergency communications model than the one we're a, employing? I'm sure there is because we've got stuff going on all over the place. And part of the um, problem with our current communication model is that it is summer and a lot of people are off contract. So people are hearing this in bits and pieces. And to some extent, they're also repeating things in bits and pieces because it's hard to make sure that everyone is hearing the whole message. I think that it would be good if we distributed sort of a chain of command, which questions go where, who is actually designated to deal with these kind of questions. What about student services? What about actual health precautions? What about messaging? So that we know who to go to, so that we don't have these questions bouncing all over the place, and we have fewer people trying to field questions that they aren't equipped to answer. We may need to push harder on people actually reading all of their email and announcements in a timely manner, even when they're off contract, which is, of course, its own can of worms because requiring people to really be involved in work when they're not on contract is difficult. But we've got a lot of fragmentation right there just because of accessibility. For sure. So anything I missed there. Did, I can't find the question itself, but did I uh, miss anything no. there? Is there anything else we can talk about? I think I, I, I think you've covered it from where I'm sitting. I will note that um, the that there is a kind of a centralized inbox for emailed questions that kind of then get farmed out to folks with the relevant expertise. And I'm sure that that email is on kind of the central uh, stout COVID response page. Mm -hmm. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I know that as a professional, I try to be really hard about, I, I try to work really hard at limiting my pronouncements to my own expertise. Um, and that then, is one thing we need people to take responsibility to do, that if you don't yeah. know the answer, don't speak for the institution and don't give it your best guess, because sometimes that's the information that gets circulated. This person in HR made their best guess about this, and now everyone's repeating it, and uh, it kind of goes everywhere. Will students get refunds for this, that, or the other? Rumors fly, things get confused, people get angry. So if you don't know, it's better to actually just say, I don't know, you need to talk to this person, even if it sounds like you're bouncing responsibility. We just need to make sure that we don't have conflicting messages on that. For sure. So um, following this theme of kind of messaging and trust, I have a question for Dr. Sweat, um, which is to say that, like as an instructor at the front of the room, like I hold my students' attention. Um, hopefully, like they're extending me some trust there as well. And so um, what are the kinds of things that maybe I can be doing to engender trust in the health related messages that they're getting uh, from elsewhere um, that are going to be really important in keeping a handle on this moving forward this fall? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that um, one of the main things we can do is model um, healthy behavior. So, um, you know, make sure we're following the precautions. Um, I think it's um, it's going to be difficult um, to teach under these conditions, and we're going to have a tendency to want to complain about it to our students. Um, so maybe try to avoid those complaints and say, I mean, acknowledge it's a difficult situation. It's not a typical situation. But every time that you say that, also reinforce, this is why it's important that we're doing it this way. So instead of saying, ah, oh, they're telling us we have to do this, say, oh, it's really hard to be up here teaching with a mask or you know that sort of thing. It's really hard to be distanced. We're not able to have groups, um, but this is why we're doing it this way. And if we're consistent in that messaging all across the classes, you know, if we're consistent in how we're explaining why we're doing it this way and we have buy-in 
with faculty and, and staff, um, then I think just sending that message and that consistent message through different channels is a is a really good idea. And I know, you know, just personally, I would have a tendency to probably complain about it to my students and I, I would resist that uh, as much as possible. I could just add one thing there, Jeff. Um, what you said is really important and you can't stress enough how important it is not to undercut your colleagues. That really is the poison in the whole campus environment. That's something we talk about a lot when we're bringing up diversity and inclusivity initiatives. You support your colleagues, you have your colleagues backs when they talk about this being a serious problem and we don't work at odds with each other. So support your colleagues, don't contradict their messages. And when you do have to admit things like, even if you are contradicting a message like both of us talked about, or admitting that something is hard, people tend to uh, remember that better when it's at the beginning or end. So we shove the bad part in the middle. This is important. It's true that this is bad, but this is important. Just the yes, no, yes model tends to get better adherence, but support your colleagues, have our backs. Very important. Great, thanks both. Um, OK, so there have been a number of questions in the queue and I've published two of them around kind of what if scenarios for if a student is either sick or has a close contact and needs to self quarantine, right? Expectations around like the kinds of instructor support for that. Um, you know, what happens if a faculty member gets sick or has a close contact and needs to quarantine? Um, a, right, we've been asked to kind of have backup instructors um, and then there's some more uh, questions around sick leave and COVID leave and those kinds of things. Um, I'm, I'm not necessarily sure who this question is directed to. Um, and and there's you know and and as I pointed out at the beginning, right? Um, none of us is um, is is in the committees doing the planning for this kind of thing. But if anyone wanted to chime in around maybe what they would like to see or what they think would be kind of um, compassionate, reasonable responses to these concerns, uh, feel free to chime in. No, I think those are those are excellent questions and I think there is a, a frequently asked questions um, on the COVID site for for Stout and I would encourage if anyone is <laughs> listening to this who um, is hearing our concerns, you know, to make sure if there are answers to these, make sure that they get into the frequently asked questions and are communicated to to everyone who needs to hear them because I think there are a lot of things that are sort of in flux and we haven't as an institution made decisions about every aspect of this, but as those decisions are made, we need to distribute that information as quickly as possible in, and as widely as we can. Dr. Hall, were you waving that you had something to chime in there as well? Yeah, but I forgot it now. <laughs> I was Sorry. listening to Jeff. He had really good things to say. That's oh, a, I, have, a I know I know Sorry. one thing so um so if one of us as an instructor has to quarantine right um so because someone in our household uh ends up being diagnosed with covid uh just also be prepared for that possibility especially if the number of cases in the community starts to rise then the probability of you coming into contact with covid rises and so just keeping in mind that having that flexibility and kind of that backup plan in the back of your mind if you aren't already teaching online or hybrid to be able to teach from home right so when you're in quarantine you're not sick by definition somebody who's in quarantine has been exposed and we're waiting to see if they're going to develop the infection um, so just to kind of think about that in advance and be ready that you might have to pivot, everybody's favorite word, um, to in giving instruction from home um, if, if that should arise. Yeah, pivot is rapidly becoming my least favorite word for sure. Um, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm interested and impressed by the 
number of questions in the queue that seem to be related to um, some of these issues of trust, um, which I think uh, uh, are, are very intriguing. And so um, I've published a representative one, which basically asks, you know, that students kind of in student only forums seem to be worried that faculty and staff aren't going to take the masking requirement seriously. Um, and that conversely, there are faculty and staff discussions in forums concerned that the students that they teach aren't going to take the mask requirement seriously. Um, and so uh, each of these groups seems to be convinced that we're, you know, our own group is going to take that requirement seriously. Is there some way to, or some messaging strategy perhaps to like, help us all see that we're on the same side here. Um, hit the message hard, early and clearly. Before class starts, everyone should email their class, a personal email from you as a professor, naming the class, mentioning what we're going to be doing, the precautions we're going to be taking, saying I will be wearing a mask every day and I expect you to do so as well. Personalized from each professor to each class, right from the beginning, hard and early, and then don't deviate from it kind of like your attendance policy in your syllabus. Yeah, I agree with that. And um, I think that there's also a group working on what to include in our syllabi to make sure that there is consistent information about these precautions and what we're doing related to COVID. So there's going to be um, some things that we're going to be, I think, required or asked to put into our syllabus. I'm not sure exactly how it's going to be um, presented to us. Um, but in addition to that, I think it's very important, as Emmy was saying, to communicate in a more, on a more personal level than what's in the syllabus. But I think we'll know sort of what the standard is by what comes out of that group about exactly what steps we're taking and what expectations we have um, that are going to be in our syllabi too. I'd like to also just add that I am going to, as Emmy mentioned, you know, specifically email or put an announcement in Canvas to each of my classes. And part of my messaging is going to be, I'm going to be wearing a mask to make sure I keep you safe. And I need to ask you to wear a mask to keep me safe, right? Um, so I think that's also really important. Another thing that didn't occur to me right away, but that I'm also going to need to tell people is this also means they can't bring their cup of coffee or their lunch or anything that they're going to eat or drink into the classroom because they would have to remove their mask. Now, you might say, well, can they bring in a soda with a straw, <laughs> right, and slip it underneath their masks? And my early thinking on that is that it might be a slippery slope and I'd probably just, it's probably just easier to just say no food and drink in the classroom and I understand that that can create some issues for students that have a lot of back-to-back -back classes, um, but that's another thing that I'm thinking about and sending the messaging out early, you know, especially I have an eight o'clock class, like please make sure you get up early enough to have your coffee before you come to class. Have you seen those terrible masks, the little hole for the straw and the overlapping thing? People are coming up with all kinds of crazy ideas. But I mean, speaking of the crazy ideas, when we're talking about what students are saying about us and what we're expecting from our students, keep listening for those narratives. Have your counter narratives ready, even if you have to address it again. Yes, no, yes. There we go. But yeah, the straw thing's hard because I can't teach for 55 minutes without having water with me. So if I'm drinking, then I'm setting, like Jeff said, being I'm not being a good model. But otherwise, I'll be talking like whiff. That's a hard one. Dang. I don't know. I mean, it's going to be so nice and humid in there because of the mask. You might not get as dry maybe, mouthed. Maybe I won't have dry <laughs> mouth for the first semester <laughs> ever. <sighs> My poor coffee addiction. <laughs> There's so many of these little I know. operational details, right? Yeah. And And I know that like when I think about this coming fall, right? Those are the place that, my, that, that's the place my brain goes, right? Me in the center, right? How am I, how, how am, am I going to adapt my own patterns to this new reality that we find ourselves living in? Um, and it's going to take a lot of really 
deliberate, intentional thought and effort. Yeah, I mean, um, to plan in advance, you may have to just visualize yourself going through your teaching process. Think about each step. Close your eyes, meditate. What do I usually do? What will cause problems? I'm going to have I think, problems. I think that um, <laughs> one of the things that I've heard that's under consideration, I'm not sure if it's finalized yet. I've, I've heard the consideration of longer passing periods, which would help with, with with faculty in that situation, anyone who's instructing would have a little bit more time. You could you could drink your you know drink um, between uh, classes if you're in the same classroom and you don't have to move from classroom to classroom that sort of thing. Um, so we'll have a little bit more time between classes possibly. I you know I'm not sure whether that's been finalized, but I know that's something that was under consideration. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Okay, so. My, um, I think our mention of the word pivot um, brought up a concern that I know that I share, and um, I'm going to rephrase it from the way that the questioner asked it, um, which is we keep being um, told that we will basically need to do the planning in advance for a pivot to 100% online instruction basically at any time. And so um, my question or our question is under what kinds of scenarios or conditions um, do we imagine that that might be necessary? And Alex, I think this is probably a question for you. Um, so I don't know what criteria the campus is going to use. I don't know what criteria Dunn County Public Health is going to use. But when we think about it, right, we think about the whole motivation for flattening the curve that we started with many, many, many months ago now. It seems like years ago, um, which is that we don't want to overwhelm our medical systems, which happened early on in New York City, is happening now in Houston um, and in other areas of the country where they're seeing big spikes. So one of the things that's going to be really important is keeping an eye on our hospital capacity. Um, because once you exceed that, then you get unnecessary deaths, right? Because the services aren't available uh, for people who need them. So that has to be a big part of it. But the tricky thing with looking at hospitalizations, and in the past couple of weeks, we've seen this huge increase in cases, especially among young people in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, I hear a lot from people, but are there more hospitalizations? You know, but are there more deaths? Are deaths going up? And the answer is, no, um, and that's for two reasons. One is that younger adults in general tend to be hospitalized at a lower rate. So in the college age group in the state of Wisconsin, about 3% of people in the age in their 20s end up needing hospitalization as opposed to it's more than 40% for people over age 70. So there's that piece, right? They are less likely to need some of those medical resources. But the other thing is that hospitalizations and deaths, there's usually a two to four week delay from when you see the number of cases go up to when you see hospitalizations and deaths go up because it takes a while from when you first get sick to get sick enough to be hospitalized or to eventually succumb to the disease and die. So even though we've seen a substantial increase in the number of cases in our nation over the past several weeks, it's only been in the past couple of days that we've started to see an uptick in the mortality rate. So there's a real inherent challenge here that you have to try to anticipate what things are going to be like in two to four weeks, knowing that there's potential uh, potential for that exponential growth in the number of cases. And that if you wait too long, the horse is already out of the barn. So I don't envy those decision makers in terms of when they're going to call it um, and say we need to flip to all online, but those would be the types of factors that they would be looking at. The rate of rise of new cases, the, uh, the medical capacity in our own community, which is small, right, relatively speaking, and also the medical capacity of our surrounding communities. So those would be the things to watch. Brilliant. Um, I have two more in the queue, and I think you're on the spot for both of them. Um, question number one is, how can you tell if your mask fits well? Um, and I think broad, even more broadly speaking, I would add to that, how important is mask fit or face covering fit? 
That's a great question. Um, so for these cloth face coverings, right, that we're recommending for lay people, um, you don't need to have a perfect fit. Um, and in fact, there is a really good video that just came out from um, It's Okay to Be Smart, which is a video production arm of PBS, looking at the fluid dynamics of exhaled air in people who are using masks. And so, we are not, when we are in the classroom or we're out in public, we are not physicians who are dealing with severely ill COVID patients who are literally coughing in our faces. We are not peering into people's throats, right? So we don't need the same level of protection that a healthcare worker working in a high risk environment needs, right? So, and in fact, even just a simple cloth face covering is highly effective at slowing down that stream of air and really mud, it really creates all these eddies. And so the particles just don't really go much beyond just the outside of your mask at all, which is really exciting. So, um, so the biggest thing in terms of fit for us is to make sure it's not going to fog up your glasses. So that's probably the most important thing. And so if you can get a mask with one of those metal nose clips, uh, that can be really helpful. Some people out of frustration will just take some little first aid tape and tape the mask here so that moisture doesn't come up. Um, so that can be really helpful. The other place, if you're using one of those pleated mask designs versus one of the more shaped ones, is just to pay attention to a gap at the sides because that can allow um, a lot of particles to kind of shoot out the sides. And remember that the mask is most effective at helping you from prevent, uh, preventing you from infecting other people. It is also somewhat helpful at protecting you from inhaling the virus, um, but it's mostly to prevent releasing the virus into the air. So you don't need to have a fit tested N95 respirator. That's only for healthcare workers who are going to be in like literally putting their faces in these clouds of virus, right? So we have to get fit tested for those. Um, but if that's not what you're going to be doing, just a bandana works great. <laughs> just whatever is going to be comfortable for you so that you wear it and make sure it has to cover your nose. So I saw a really great um, graphic the other day and it, and it said wearing your mask like this, you know, with the nose sticking out is like wearing your underwear like this. And there was an organ hanging out, right? So it says we need to keep it covered. So um, that's really important. It's amazing to me how many people I see walking around with their nose hanging out. That's practically like wearing no mask at all. So whatever works for you, whatever is comfortable for you that you can wear without having to adjust frequently is excellent. And also sometimes people ask me about eye protection um, because the, the way you get the virus primarily is by breathing it in. Um, so that's far and away the number one way you get it. Um, you can get it possibly through the eyes. There are a couple of case reports from Italy where people got pink eye or conjunctivitis as the presenting symptom. Um, it can happen, but that happened in people who were sticking their faces in other people's faces. So if we're not doing that, we aren't really going to need eye protection, uh, again, because that six feet of distancing is going to be really helpful. I think I answered that. That was fantastic. Okay. So um, I will ask you one final question, which you answered for me already, but I hope you can share again, which is that um, uh, somebody has been washing their hands a whole lot and <sighs> want to know like if, say, a moisturizing disinfectant thing works as well or, or what you do about that. Okay, good. So the great thing about this virus is it has a lipid envelope, right? So it's surrounded by this kind of greasy coat, which is awesome because then if you have soap or any type of a detergent, it will break that apart. So um, it's very susceptible to soap, which is awesome. So for hand washing, the important thing is to just get a nice lather. It doesn't matter what kind of soap you use. It doesn't matter if it's antibacterial. This isn't a bacterium anyway, right? So just whatever soap works well for you. If you find a lotion soap is better, that's great. But the the, the big pearl that I want to give you from healthcare providers who wash their hands a lot is don't use hot water. <laughs> use lukewarm water. 
hot, you can't get the water hot enough to kill the germs, right? So um, all that happens if you use really hot water to wash your hands is that you dry your skin out and your hands get chapped and cracked and then you don't want to wash them anymore and then that's terrible. So um, just lukewarm water is totally fine. You just want to get a really good lather and really good suds and make sure you cover all the surfaces of your hands and that's that's how you want to do it. That All really right. sensitive skin moisturizing Dawn detergent is that is specifically made to not dry your hands out when they're wet constantly. Good for if your hands are cracking. Food service tip. Wonderful. All right. So we have reached the end of our hour together. Massive thank you to Drs. Hall, Stemke, and Sweat. Um, there was one final question which I want to address as we close, which is how can we um, share the useful information that has been shared here more broadly. Um, I will have um, a recording of this uh, of this discussion available and um, we'll get it transcoded and posted to YouTube this afternoon. And so I will have it titled COVID Campus and You. Um, it will be under my personal YouTube account, Brian Teague. Um, so feel free to go hunting for that here in a little bit. Thank you for, thank you to our panelists. Thank you to everybody who submitted questions. Thank you to everybody who showed up and joined us for this. And um, I look forward to uh, seeing everybody uh, say Safe and masked up back on fall this uh, back on campus this coming fall. Have a good afternoon. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Brian. <laughs>